paste. Okay, gang. Um, we're going to the handout. Uh, we, on Friday, I believe, did we go through the entire number two? We found the order of the three reactants in that one. We found the K value and the units on K. Um, we uh, probably, using trial one day, I'm thinking that they asked us to find, oh yeah, that's how we find K, yep. And then for part D, D was uh, find the initial rate of B and C. Let's not do that part. So yeah, we're done with two. Even if you're kind of unsettled about that, let's go on and do another one. We didn't get the units on K? Since this reaction was third order, the units on, did you get the value of K but not the unit? No, we did not. We didn't do the K value. Okay, let's do K. Let's do K. Our K is so easy, though. Use trial one, and we're going to go ahead and do part B of number two, and then we're going to stop and move on. Using trial one, and the reason that I chose trial one is the numbers are the simplest. Uh, we have 0.1 for all the concentrations, and just look for the one that's the simplest. So the rate, which is 2.5 times 10 to the negative 4. Remember that's measured in molarity per second. Equals. Uh, it was... A to the second power, so we have K times concentration of A to the second power, B to the zero power, so I'm just going to leave that out, and then 0.1 for C to the first power. So it's like that. And this is in molarity. I'll put that down here, and this is in molarity. Yes? So we just solve for K. This is too simple to spend class time doing. You're, you're better than this. So uh, that's going to be 10 to the negative second and 10 to the negative first multiplied together is 10 to the negative third. So this divided by 10 to the negative third is 2.50 times 10 to the negative one. And the unit on it is going to be molarity per second divided by molarity cubed. What's that going to look like at the end? One over molarity squared second. Anybody have any questions about that? Okay, you see how I got the number? I took this and divided by those numbers. This all multiplies out to 10 to the negative third. Just divided there. Okay, so anyway, we're going to move on. Um, I think it's number five that we go to next. Yes, jump to number five. Number five is uh, not a nice one either. The next two that we do, we're taken off of actual AP exams, so you get a feel for the college board's tendency to uh, test you and what they do. Uh, yes, they're they're off of old AP. Yep. So uh, some of them, not all of them are, but I know this. Link like, link at the bottom of the page says go on to the next page. Yeah, that's oh. what they're doing there. So. Okay, so for number five. You see how this one is a stinker too because one of these reactants is not ever held constant. They ran three trials and uh, one of them changes every time. Which one is the easier reactant to find the order of? First one. Second one. Oh, my because the first one is held constant in two trials, use those two trials and see how the second one affects the rate. So yeah, the one that's held constant, find the uh, order of the other one easy. So we're going to use trials one and two and uh, find what the order of F2 is. Are you with me on that? Yes. So ClO2 is not affecting the rate because it's being held constant. F2 is going up by four. When F2 goes up by four, what's happening to the rate? It goes up by four. What's the order of F2 then? First order. Right. So we know now order of F2 is first order. Okay. So now we have some work. We need the order of ClO2, but F2 is never held constant. So you have to know what the order of F2 is, though, and we've just found that. So um, we're going to use that to see if we can determine the ClO2. Now, what trials do you want to use? Trial 
I have a suggestion up here. Maybe we'll use that one. Yeah. Go ahead, Andrew. Why two and three? <laughs> For some people, now it depends on how good you are with abstract math. Yes? If Nick, can we use two and three because like you're doubling uh, scale of two and you're like one half mean at two? And then the rate's not changing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, I'm going to use one and three to kind of illustrate that, and then once we know what the order of CL2 is, we'll see how that plays into two and three. You're probably good mathematically, and you can see stuff. And, and other people probably can't too, but I don't know if everybody can. So let's use one and three, where we know what the concentration of F2, and I'm going to use the, uh, the camera here and, and go through this. Here's what I'm suggesting that you do for number five. For the order of uh, ClO2, we're going to try to find this one's order. We see that from trial one to three, the F2 is doubled. Now when the F2 doubles, knowing that it's first order, what should it do to the rate? Double. It doubles it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw an arrow with the F2 above it and say, OK, because of the F2 doubling, this thing should double to 4.8 times 10 to the negative 3. Would you agree? That is the uh, influence of the F2 double. Now that we've taken into account the F2 change, now go from that rate to that rate and see how it changes. The ClO2 is doubling from 0.01 to 0.02. What's happening to the rate from here to here? It doubles. So what's the order of ClO2? first order as well. Now, what I just did was uh, I had to correct this rate based on the reactant whose order I knew. So change that rate uh, from the reactant that you know, and then go from that corrected rate to the final rate with respect to what happens in the other concentration. Does that make sense? So this one, I don't know, it, it, it takes a little bit of different thinking. When one of them is held, are not held constant, like this, uh, that one's never held constant. So you have to find out its rate order and then uh, uh, apply its rate like we did right there. So both of these are first order. The rate law would then be, I'll just write it in pencil here and stay on this, rate equals K times ClO2 to the first times F2 to the first. What is the numerical value of the rate constant? Do we have to do this part? It's so easy. Which trial would you use? Trial one. Just trial one because you have all 0 .01, 0 .1 in there. The numbers are very easy. You're going to plug in this value for the rate. You're going to plug in that value for ClO2 and that value for F2 and then solve for K. What's the unit on K going to be? Yeah, Vincent, go ahead. Oh, because even though there's a coefficient of two, and it's not on this page, but up there, everybody sees the, uh, the balance equation. That balance equation just says what mole ratio they react in. It does not give you what the rate law is. And remember, I tried to make a big deal of that last week. You can't just look at a chemical equation and say anything about the rate or the rate law. You have to do it by experiment. So ignore the, uh, um, the balance equation when you're finding the rate law. Now, you won't be able to ignore the balance equation in step C. So we'll do that in a second, but uh, um, yeah. Don't think that because there's a two in front of it, it's second power or second order is not necessary. So um, my question was, are we all comfortable in power B? You know how to find the K value, right? What was the unit on K? One over M squared seconds. One over molarity seconds, not M squared. Because Remember, the rate is molarity over seconds, and this is molarity squared. So one of the molarities uh, is going to cancel out from the square, so you just have one over molarity seconds. Now let's jump to C. Look at C. In experiment two, what is the initial rate of decrease of F2? Now I have to show you the chemical equation up here. It's a 2 to 1 to 2 ratio. You see how the uh, coefficients look here? What is the initial rate of decrease of F2? What you have to do is look at, okay, how are they defining the rate? 
They're defining the rate as the increase of this product, CLO2F. That's this thing right here. So in experiment two, the rate of increase of the product is 9.6 times 10 to the negative third. That's how fast the product is being increased. How fast is the F2 getting used up? That's what the question is. Is it foul? Oh, I thought you were raising your hand. So if trial two says that the uh, product, which is what it's defining right here, increase of the product. The product is increasing at this rate. How fast is that getting used up? Yeah, half as fast because it's a one to two ratio. So the, the rate law is not dependent on the chemical equation, but the relative rates, when you know the rate of one of them, the, uh, you can find the other ones, you use the coefficients for that part. Yes? That's what you're using, yeah. Yep. You take that rate and multiply it by one over two and find out what the rate, the, yeah, the rate of the F2 depletion is. No, you could just, I don't know, it's probably, I don't know if they would mark you wrong if you didn't say negative. What is the initial rate of this decrease? Nah, just leave it as positive. Any other questions about that? Do you see what we just did? So the answer for part C would be that divided by 2, 4.8 times 10 to the negative third. OK, now for this part, uh, part D, which of these mechanisms is consistent with the rate law? For a mechanism to be valid, there has to be two things that are true. Did you read about those? Yeah. What's one of them? All the steps have to add up to that balance equation. Do both of these mechanisms add up to that balance equation? Look at the first one. We have an intermediate there. There's an intermediate there. Cancels out there. There's an intermediate there, and that cancels out there. Take out the intermediates. Do they add up to that? Yes, they do. So mechanism one, they do add up to the balance equation. What about mechanism two? Does that add up to the balance equation? Easier to see that one. Yeah, that one does too. So both of them uh, fit that criteria. What about the other criteria for um, for knowing whether a mechanism is valid? If the rate law of the mechanism reflects the rate law that was experimentally determined. Now, um, here's the rate law that was experimentally determined. It's k times that to the first power and that to the first power. In this slow step, it looks like they're defining the rate based on the intermediate. Yes? So how does that look for uh, um, that fitting that rate law? Well, at first, not so good. Jacob? Yes, in order for a mechanism to be valid, both of those things have to be satisfied. Yep. Yep. So this one adds up to the overall balance equation. But the rate law is kind of funny because the slow step there, it would be k times that thing. So it appears that this is not going to be the correct uh, uh, mechanism. However, it is going to turn out to be correct, but we can't see yet why. I'll show you in a second. Number two, though, this is our slow step. And uh, does this one reflect? that rate law? No. no, there's not a CLO2 in the slow step. We just say, well, hold on, there's not one in here either. This one is more incorrect than that one. And I'll tell you why this one is valid. Because how was this intermediate produced in the previous step? It was produced by an equilibrium reaction. And you know what happens in equilibrium, right? There's some reactants present and there's some products present. And the reaction stops. So, I gotta show you this. The rate of uh, mechanism one is defined like this. The rate equals uh, K times the concentration of the reactants in the slow step, ClO2F. Would you agree that that's the uh, rate law for the set first mechanism? Yeah. F2? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Thanks. Okay, now over here I'm gonna say this. The equilibrium constant in the first step, see how this is an equilibrium reaction? We know how to find an equilibrium constant, products over reactants. So it would be concentration of ClO2F2 over uh, concentration of the reactants, ClO2 